So, after 100 years of uh, weather observation, we have to uh, show how the data is won at the source. So, on the left hand side, you can see the weather station. So, 100 years are over. And now we look uh, how it looks like. So this is uh, the structure of my presentation, so I will show you these parameters, how the data was registered during the time, so challenges means uh, it means work. So first uh, the measuring field, so that's how it started. So we have to go back one. So the measuring field was not very big, so almost non-existing. And so they thought then during winter time it was not possible to go outside every time to do the observations there, and that's why uh, they built a big shelter there for uh, temperature measuring, measuring and humidity measuring, and uh, to the left and to the right there are extensions, so this was for precipitation measurement, and even snow was melted automatically by means of chemicals and were measured. Here you can see it again, the big shelter. Uh, you could go directly from the office into this shelter. Here you can see the measuring field that was designed in the 1950s. Uh, it was a little bit bigger then. And you see also the shelters for thermometers, one there and one there. So in this one, which was closer to the building, there were already automatic measurements uh, done by resistance thermometers and a precipitation can and a precipitation detector were already distributed. In 2006, after the political change, uh, this was refurbished, so the inner field uh, went to the outside, outside of this area, and the measuring field was uh, designed in an optimal way, and as a mountain uh, station at this elevation level, uh, it's a very exemplary measuring field. So that's how it looks like after the refurbishment and with the uh, maximum equipment. This was what was possible then. Some uh, equipment was uh, taken out again because they were used somewhere else, because when people were working there, then you don't need so many automatic devices. And that's a current picture. That's how it looks like now. Here you can see the visibility measurement, uh, the fine dust measurement, the two shelters for thermometers. And this uh, station was designed in 2006 as climate reference station, and that's why we have the two shelters for thermometers, conventional uh, thermometers, and on the left hand side with the automatic uh, uh, sensors, capacitive air humidity. Uh, measurement and uh, temperature measurement with the resistance measurement. And you can see uh, the ground temperature and the soil temperature, conventional and uh, automatic up to one meter in depth. And uh, there is also testing of barometers. But uh, so far it was not used, but we do some weeding there to make sure that it can be used later on. And on the right-hand edge of this measuring field, uh, the precipitation is uh, measured. So uh, from the beginning, from the very beginning, Hellman method is used with a 500 square centimeter Hellman and a 200 square centimeter Hellman. And we also use the Pluvio at 200 square meters. So the task for measuring means also care for the measuring field. So you can see uh, before and after the care. 
Now the air pressure, so this is one of the components where there are not so many challenges. Uh, of course, you can always misread something, but else there are almost no problems. Also, the automatic sensors nowadays have uh, the quality of the barometer that we used from the very beginning, and the deviations can be ignored. And uh, we use a bar graph parallel on the right hand side, you can see it. Now, uh, the wind direction and wind speed, so this is a little bit uh, more difficult to measure it uh, automatically. In 1916, when this uh, weather station was uh, built up, uh, Mr. Schreiber also developed uh, his own equipment. For example, this wind measuring device. So these are cast iron steel plates. And there was a hose connected to it, and all the eight hoses went together. And in these uh, pressure classes, they have shown different levels, and depending on direc wind direction and wind speed, and because of these differences, um, uh, it could be calculated. But you could see that these hoses could not be this long, so the indicators were up there, so it was not possible to uh, move them all the way to the office, which was at the ground level. So that means for every measurement, uh, the observer had to uh, climb up the tower to read. The measurements there. And the special thing about this device is that Professor Paul Schreiber already thought of this to have a static uh, pressure measurement uh, without any movable parts. And uh, still you need some heating. So he installed the heating up there. And so coal was used then, and ventilation, but it was not so efficient. It was not sufficient because when you have bad weather conditions, you need a lot of heating there, and so it didn't work very well. But he was optimist, so he thought it would work in any weather conditions. So uh, afterwards, uh, the measuring system of Fuß was used. You can see the measuring drum there. It's a steam jet uh, anemometer. So there is a float shooter, and this was lifted. And it was writing on this drum, so still it meant that we had to uh, measure this uh, hourly. So we had to read the wind values uh, every hour. So, but uh, this device was also heated. You can see it from this heating pot. And uh, the air was sucked on in the basement. And the output was about one kilowatt in order to keep the wind measuring device free of ice. But in extreme weather conditions, this was not sufficient. And so somebody had to walk up there. And in this area, there was a hook, and you had to uh, scratch the eyes off. So regarding uh, work safety, you could not do this now anymore. So until the political change, this wind measuring device was used, and the heating output was getting less and less. It was uh, replaced very often. And so during winter time, uh, it could not be heated. And so uh, the wind data was lost, and it could only be estimated and calculated, but it was not real measurement. Only after the political change, we used uh, this wind measuring uh, device and by the company Tees, and uh, this and is heated, and it was a great improvement, and there was not so much but failure, but still, with some time, so this uh, device is used now 25 uh, years, so new systems are developed now, and so it can look like this when the heating is not working 
very well, and this happened uh, more frequently during the last years. So every two years, uh, there is maintenance uh, for these devices, but still there can be failures of the heating and the problem uh, with this movable part. So this is not very easy to uh, transport the heating up to it. Here you can see uh, the ice that you could have, the ice deposits on uh, the wind vanes. And also in 2006, when we modified the whole system, the wind was uh, have to be measured six meters uh, above the rooftop. And in the first year, there were similar deposits, and the architect was really surprised that uh, it could stand it because of the big load of ice. So, in the horizontal range, uh, this was 1 meter 80, and so there are tons of ice uh, on this whole mass. So, in these cases that the uh, device is not working well, we have to measure it manually, that's how it looks like. And, of course, we only have a, a current wind speed during this moment. And uh, to make sure that we don't lose any values, but of course we cannot uh, measure wind peaks during this time. We can only add it by other things. So that's the newer genera uh, generation of wind uh, sensors, ultrasonic wind sensors. So this was to test uh, the heating, and you can see the ice deposits on the shaft. So these are enormous, and there are always shadings and turbulences. Uh, doesn't matter where the wind comes from, and that's why the wind cannot be measured exactly anymore. So it's very important to improve the heating of the shaft so that it works well. So nowadays, uh, these wind measuring devices are further developed, also a 3D wind measuring device, and also that you can uh, measure higher wind speeds, not only 60 meters per second so that they so can also be used in a uh, mountain uh, station. Air temperature, air humidity, you would think there are no problems, but that's not really like this. Here you can see how the measuring devices are distributed. On the right-hand side, the conventional shelter, and on the left-hand side, the electronic shelter with the resistance thermometer and how they are placed in the measuring field. Here you can see the weather conditions in the mountain station, how the weather shelters can uh, look like, so they can really be uh, hidden in the snow, so you almost have to crawl on your belly to measure these values, to read the values, and even if there is no snow but frost, uh, you see this uh, frozen a fog there. So it's really a challenge to get rid of the ice there. And you can see how it looks like when you do this. So that's how the temperature was measured before. And the effect that we have after cleaning when we got rid of the ice. So you can see a failure in measuring there. So it's almost a difference of one degree when we don't get rid of the ice. So this was uh, during the evening when there is no radiation anymore. And even inside the shelter when you have extreme uh, snow conditions and storm conditions, uh, the snow goes through these veins and it goes onto uh, the sensors. And, uh, and if, you don't, if you don't have observers there or if the observers uh, don't check this, 
then you will also have wrong measurements. So if you have weather conditions like this, you always have to check it and look after it and clean the ice and snow off to have exact measurements. So if we measure it like this, and we have a high pressure system and the air humidity, then we would have to wait uh, hours or even days until the measurement will be correct anymore. Uh, again. And the same, same with the thermal hygrograph, which is also inside the shelter. So we uh, used our own initiative. We used a grid like this to make sure to solve the problem. And then it worked very well. The minimum uh, thermometer for the ground. Uh, it can be adjusted to the snow level and it can be also cleaned when you have human uh, personnel there and you need a brush and, and uh, carefully brush it off in order to have the correct measurement. And here you have the effect if you don't clean it, how it looks like, or if you don't find out that it's underneath the snow cover, so the temperature uh, is dropping and only after cleaning uh, the temperature is shown correctly. And here you can see the visibility and uh, the clouds uh, were open and then the fog started and you see right away with the air humidity and with the temperature. You wouldn't have this effect if we wouldn't clean uh, the shelter because of the fog and the frost and all. And another effect that we found out, but this is only possible to find out about it when you can register the values continuously. So when there are cold temperatures, it's hard uh, to detect uh, the air humidity. Here you see the temperature curve and the air humidity curve. And when there is uh, cold temperatures, you have this problem, but uh, this is a difference in percentage. So 94%, 90%, it's not very dramatic, but you can see the colder it gets, uh, the more difficult uh, the measurement of the air humidity will be. So these are different measurements of six different days. So to see that's not only a single case, but uh, that's um, every time. And now precipitation. Here you can see the 500 uh, square centimeters. Uh, Helmen. And this is used since the uh, January of 1916. Not exactly this can, but this the principle of this measurement. So that's how the colleague looks like during measurement. Uh, automatic uh, precipitation detectors cannot be lifted, so sometimes they are uh, covered by snow. And even also the Hellman is not fällt, dann ist der possible to be used for every weather condition. So when snow is coming there and it's filled up, then it cannot get Auch up more snow, take up more snow. And also the rain recorder cannot be used during winter time because of heating Auch effects ja. you have too much uh, loss. And also the cone ice, ice, uh, ices in winter time and doesn't give the value that we uh, is expect. So as soon as there is snow there, uh, there is a resistance pulse. So when there, there is a heavy wind and drops come there, uh, then it shows precipitation, although there is no precipitation. So it should be installed on the tower, then you wouldn't have this effect. But up to now, it said uh, that it should be put two meters from the ground. 
but in mountain areas it doesn't make really sense. And now the snow depth and snow density. So, on our station at Fichtelberg, we want to measure the snow depth as exact as possible, and this for more than 50 or 60 years already. And we already started to have 40 uh, different measurements in uh, the four uh, main directions. We made 10 measurements in every main direction. And we registered the station. So we put marks on the trees to make sure that these uh, measuring sections are marked properly. And we measured it with different colleagues to see uh, the deviations, and there were not many big deviations. So, uh, after the polygon change, we started to use stationary uh, snow depth measurements in these areas where there is not so much uh, snow blown to or blown away from. And we have 40 stationary uh, snow level meters there. So, but still it takes about two hours. And again, it means some sports when you have fresh snow of more than half a meter. Uh, it means big efforts. Nowadays, uh, we found out that we don't uh, need the 40 uh, different uh, positions, but we reduce them to 16, so four in every main direction. So this, this is how it looks like. These are bars, and again, the colleague during snow depth measuring. So snow uh, is not homogeneous uh, around the weather station. We have also automatic uh, snow depth measurements. Uh, it measures exactly up to centimeters, but you cannot uh, use a point measurement in a mountain area. Uh, in the lowlands, it's, it's possible when you have the correct position, but in a mountain area, it's almost not possible. So there are big differences in uh, the snow level. So on the right hand side, no snow at all. And on the day where we uh, took the pictures, uh, the mean, the average value were 1 meter 15. And again, even the snow level sensor needs some heating, which it doesn't have. So this has to be also cleaned from ice and uh, snow to measure exactly. So this was the latest testing, uh, a snow level sensor measuring for three points. But uh, the German uh, weather service uh, <coughs> decided that it's not exact enough, and so it's not used anymore. <coughs> the snow density measurement, we already heard about this a little bit uh, this morning, how it was done in history and today. Again, we looked for homogeneous uh, positions to measure the snow density. And we measure this where the snow is quiet. And so this is in a wooden area. But uh, you should not have the shade of, of uh, the trees there. But once we found the correct position, we could uh, measure correct results. So we do at least two different uh, measurements of snow density in one area. And when there is a deviation of more than two tenths, then we measure it a third time. And then we can use this value further. So the old snow sensors were a little bit uh, more difficult to use. Now we have a taper shape, and so we cut out the snow 
mit Sand des Schnees hochziehen oder und dann wir können wir können dann abwiegen. Also up the pipe diese Verfahren together with the snow without anything to fall out. And so this is an optimized uh, principle method. Haben wir aber jetzt ja nur versuchsweise manchmal gemacht. Um Sometimes we tested it also in the area. So Strahlungsmessung. Now the radiation measurement. Von der Historie. Again, hat es im Jahr a picture of the history. It started in 1957 with the International Geophysical Year. This tower was erected and uh, we started to measure uh, the global radiation and the diffuse sky radiation. And that's uh, how the equipment uh, looks like that we still use, but the sunshine recorder, we don't use this anymore. Auch hier ist es ja von der But also here, the measuring method is difficult uh, for heating because they have thermal elements and when you heat thermal elements, it's counterproductive, so you cannot use this here. So there's only ventilation for this uh, equipment and so in winter months they cannot be used. So the kann sunshine duration also measurement Hat can also measure the radiation output. There is a heating, hier, but it's, too, it's not sufficient, it's only 40 Watt. But if we have to correct heating there, we could so get rid of this problem. And now visibility, they have uh, DF20 plus that we use. Also not enough heating, the output is not sufficient for mountain stations. So you see an example before and after. And the effects after cleaning, you can see them at the bottom. The visibility, it shows 100 meters, but actually it's only 40 meters. And then uh, the ice builds up again, then we clean again, and you see the difference, clearly. So when you had some heating, we could get rid of this problem, but the F20 plus is also not so suited for mountain stations, because you still have this uh, effect of a sunny day, a uh, big global radiation, and the maximum uh, visibility are 70 kilometers, but actually we would have 200 kilometers on this day. But with the solar radiation, the F20 plus uh, reacts to it, and uh, the visibility measurement is reduced, so it only shows 10 kilometers. So we cannot get rid of this effect. When there are clouds uh, in the sky and uh, visibility up to 10, 20 kilometers, then it works very well. But when there is direct solar radiation, uh, then we have difficulties to measure it. So as a summary, as a conclusion, so of course you could see it also as a negative example that something is not working, but it's not like this. We try to um, show all the things uh, how it works, because normally you don't uh, talk about things that work well. So you can see that we measure elements values as exact as possible with all the handling possibilities that we have. So the, the data series is exact as possible, so it's 100 years old, and when uh, this is uh, continued, then it should be continued in the same quality as we did so far. Thank you. Ganz herzlichen Dank, Herr Franze, Thank you very much, Mr. Franze, for this very impressive presentation from practice uh, to show the challenges in everyday life. And it's also 